Episode 2, Epitaph The village graveyard was a foreboding place. It was filled with graves of people who had survived their living years in New Patedzi village and had eventually died. Each day that I walked through the graveyard on my way to and from school, I feared that a ghost would pop out of one of the graves and harm me. I was not the only person in New Patedzi village who had a phobia of the village graveyard. Several villagers purported to have seen ghostly shadows which eerily appeared out of the blue and glided aimlessly around the graveyard. Others claimed to have seen balls of fire floating above the graves and tall ghostly shadows of entities with paranormal height such that they were taller than the tallest tree. I'd observed that some of the graves were very old, unkept, abandoned, and had weeds and shrubs almost obscuring them, but newer graves were better tended. My mother's grave was located somewhere in the graveyard. I knew that her grave was well kept because my grandparents visited her final resting place monthly to tend to her grave. This gesture also kept my mother's memory alive in their hearts. Every week, my two friends, Shingai, Farai, and I walked across the footpath that ran through the middle of the graveyard, which was a shortcut to our school, in silence and we only resumed talking when we had crossed the graveyard to the other side. But one morning, Shingai suddenly stopped walking and said, let's read epitaphs on grave headstones. Her words sent a cold shiver down my spine, and I couldn't fathom what had come over her to suggest such a forbidden thing. Seeing my frightened look, Shingai said, there's nothing to fear. I've heard that ghosts are not active during the day and only come out at midnight. I was very frightened and felt nervous and uncomfortable and in almost a whisper I reminded Shingai of graveyard etiquette that elders warned should always be observed when walking through the graveyard, which included not pointing to graves, maintaining silence as a matter of respect for the deceased, not walking on top of graves, and not reading epitaphs. Shingai ignored my warning, and she began reading epitaphs out loud. Not wanting to attract any bad vibes, I said a prayer in my heart asking God to protect me from any evil that could be lurking in the graveyard. Then Shingai stumbled upon a very old and unkept grave which was obscured by long weeds and shrubs. She cleared away the weeds and shrubs and read the epitaph which denoted that the grave's occupant was named Tikafa Naro. His birth date was recorded as the 29th of April 1900 and his death date was recorded as the 30th of November 1925. His epitaph read, Tikafa Naro will avenge the perpetrator who murdered him. The epitaph clearly indicated that Tikafa Naro's grave was sinister. His death must have grieved his family so much, for them to write such an epitaph. A cold chill ran down my spine, I felt a shortness of breath, I became dizzy, and my heart pounded against my chest. Noticing my uneasiness, for I wrapped her arm around my waist to support me and as we walked, I tripped on a stone but her grip around my waist managed to save me from falling to the ground. I sighed with relief when we finally got out of the environs of the graveyard. I told Shingai and Farai that I would never again walk along the footpath that ran across the middle of the graveyard and rather use the longer route to and from school. I would still reach school on time if I left home 30 minutes earlier than the time I had usually departed. For the rest of the day, I could not stop wondering who Tikafa Naro had been, what his life had been like, who had murdered him, and why. Upon my return from school that afternoon, I asked my grandparents if they had ever heard about Tikafa Naro who had met his death 60 decades before by being murdered. At the mention of Tikafa Naro's name, both my grandparents looked at me sharply and my grandmother questioned me how I had found out about him. I related that morning's incident when Shingai, Farai, and I were walking to school along the footpath that ran through the graveyard, and how I had found it unsettling. A graveyard is not a playground and reading epitaphs is not a harmless game, my grandfather said. I asked him if the spirits that had been disrespected by Shingai would punish and haunt me and he assured me that I had not done anything wrong, so I had no cause for worry. I told my grandparents that I had decided to desist from walking along the footpath that ran through the graveyard again. Then I repeated the question of whether my grandparents had ever heard about Tikafa Naro, and they both looked at each other nervously. There was a momentary awkward silence, 
Then my grandmother told me not to concern myself with issues that were unimportant, and she asked me to go outside to pick green vegetables from the garden. After walking out of the kitchen hut, I heard my grandparents talking in hushed tones and I became curious about what they were discussing because I suspected that it had something to do with Tikafa Naro's grave. I'd picked up the habit of eavesdropping on my grandparents' and relatives' conversations whenever I thought that the conversation had something to do with the mystery surrounding my deceased mother. How else could I glean information if my grandparents were not willing to tell me anything? I tiptoed back to the kitchen hut and stood as close to the entrance as I could without being seen by my grandparents and listened in on their conversation. Shingai is a naughty child, and she does not have graveyard etiquette, I heard my grandfather say in anger. Why did she have to stumble upon Tikafa Naro's grave which is a secret that Chiwanizo should not know about, he added. I heard my grandmother say, I hope that Chiwanizo doesn't uncover any more things about Tikafa Naro or his avenging spirit until we disclose everything to her. My eyes widened as I heard the information that was not meant for my ears. I now knew that it was not me running to the wrong conclusion that Tikafa Naro had something to do with my mother's troubled life. It was unknown to my grandparents that the dry skeletal bones which they were trying to hide from me in the closet had started tumbling out and that I was slowly putting the jigsaw puzzles together. I looked forward to the day that I'd finally pay respects to my deceased mother for the very first time. The reason I had never visited the final resting place of my dearly departed mother was because my grandparents had said that I would start accompanying them when I turned 11 years. I had turned 11 two weeks before and when the day to visit my mother's grave finally arrived, I looked forward to the experience. It was early morning when we left the homestead, destined for the village graveyard. My grandmother carried a broom to sweep around my mother's grave, my grandfather carried a shovel and a grass slasher to cut overgrown grass and pull out weeds and I held a colorful bunch of wildflowers to place on top of my mother's grave. One evening, two weeks later, my grandmother was cooking the evening meal on the fireplace, and she instructed me to go outside and remove our clothes from the washing line. I ventured out of the kitchen hut and was greeted by twinkling stars that were shining in the evening sky. Then out of nowhere a flaming red ball of light appeared in the sky and lit up the area where I stood. I was startled and I let out a piercing scream and rushed back into the kitchen hut. My grandfather was checking on the cattle at the kraal when he heard my piercing scream, and he rushed to the kitchen hut to check what had transpired. He found me clutched in the arms of my grandmother and shedding tears as she comforted me. My grandparents understood that it was all right for me to cry and they allowed me to shed my tears until my tears had run dry. After I stopped crying, they asked me what had freaked me out. I described the flaming fireball in the sky which had appeared as if it was falling out of the sky, directly toward me to consume me. That was a frightening incident, and I understand why you're upset, my grandmother said. She went on to reassure me that if ghosts existed, I was safe and had no reason to worry because ghosts didn't harm innocent people. My grandfather added, according to my knowledge, ghosts are angry and restless souls of the deceased who were murdered and only meet out vengeance on the perpetrator who caused their death. End of episode 2